In the early hours of the 14th of June, 2017, the residents of Grenfell Tower woke up to this. Britain's worst fire since the Blitz. There's still people in the building. I know there's still people in the building. They need to get out. Using never seen before eyewitness footage. Grenfell's on fire, man. No. Oh my God. This is the story of the first 24 hours of the survivors who escaped. This guy's sending a rope! I don't do hey! it! I don't do it! The smoke was so thick, I put my hand out and I couldn't see my hand, the end of my hand. Of those who were rescued. She was crying, choking. They saw me and they just picked me up. The neighbours who witnessed it all. Help her! Help her up there! Her specific voice was ringing out at the time more than anyone else's for me. And for the first time, one of the firefighters speaks in detail about what they saw inside. None of us want to lose our lives, but it's the job that we do. Oh, shit, oh! We're firefighters, we go in and rescue people. Me and my colleague that night brought nine people out all together. And finally, how shock turned to anger and cries for justice. A building was not fireproof! The greatest horror in Europe! It's the 13th of June, 2017, in West London. It was a summer night, it was a hot night, and I was just sitting at home watching TV. I remember coming home telling the kids, make sure you go and do your homework. Actually, on that night, there was no nice, good film in the, in the TV. So I went to bed at exactly 11 o'clock. I switched off the light. At Battersea Fire Station, crew manager Aldo Diana is just starting a night shift. It was just a, a normal, calm Tuesday night. As a crew manager, I, I'm generally in the office doing the, the next shift, you know, who's riding what machines, the next shift, and all that, all that sort of stuff. Just waiting for an incident to happen, uh, and then to deal with it. At 12.54, a 999 call comes in. Four fire engines are dispatched to a fire at Grenfell Tower. Oh, shit. Oh, Grenfell's on fire, man. Fully on fire. One of the earliest known witness videos shows fire coming from a fourth floor window. Starting in a fridge, it's filmed by Shane Brewer. I'm lucky my mum don't live in this block no more. A firefighter truck pulled in, it was just one, and two, two of them came with a hose and tried to tackle the fire from the outside. Grenfell Tower on fire, fire brigade, everything. Look. In the commotion, a few people are calmly leaving the building. But on the fourth floor, Alison Moses is preparing for bed. I was about to go and turn the TV off, but then the door knocked. So I got up, I went and looked through the spy hole, and I saw my next door neighbor. So I opened the door and I said to, he said to me, um, there's a fire. I'm still calm because I couldn't smell fire couldn't smell smoke. I think I'm on the phone this time, talking with my daughter. Alison's daughter, Malika, lives close by. Mum gave me a call, saying that there was a fire. So I said, you know what, Mum, just open the window, your sitting room window, and take your keys, your mobile, and that's it, and just, just leave the flat, just in case. So um, I've tried to make my way down the stairs, and I met two firemen going up. They didn't say anything. As another resident takes the same route out as Alison, fire crews head for the fourth floor to attack the flames from the inside. 
But on the outside, there's now a problem. That's going high into the next yards. It's going into the next yard. My mate said, it's going up, it's going up. It's spreading, it's spreading. Fire spreading up. There's people in there, I swear. They need to get out. So I'm still talking to her on the phone as she's leaving the apartment. And then the phone had cut out. So with that, me and my son, we just literally ran at the flat. I'm leaving the place calm. Got to the main entrance, and when I got outside, there was this massive flame adjacent to my sitting room. Oh my God. And I'm just standing there. I've got a set of keys in my hand and they're not going to open no door. And all I've got on me that I own is my shoes, my dressing gown. That's all I own. Everything else, everything else is just gone. Oh, my God! Oh, my God. Fires and tower blocks are usually contained to a room or a flat, so the rapidly spreading flames have taken the brigade by surprise. They call for backup. By 1.24, six and more fire engines are on their way to Grenfell. So too is Alison Moses' daughter, Malika. But it felt like a lifetime I was running for. Literally, the whole tower was ablaze. So with that, I panicked, and I'm trying to look for her. Oh, my. In just minutes, the fire has climbed almost to the top on one side. Around 350 people live here. Some are asleep, but others are starting to appear at the windows. Look, there's still people in the building. I know there's still people in the building. Hundreds of people are dialing 999. Residents who call are told to follow Grenfell's existing fire action advice. Stay put unless the fire is in or affecting your flat. Get out! Get out! Fire! Fire! You can see people in their windows waving, waving. And everybody that was dancing is like, get out, get out. So far, the blaze is still only on the east face. Those on the other three sides can't see it, though black smoke filled with toxins, including cyanide, is now filling all the common areas. Oh, my God. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yeah, a lot of people are man screaming. Local resident Sammy Wordy is on the northwest corner. Help her! Help her up there! I can hear other voices, but her specific voice was ringing out at the time more than anyone else's for me. I could see her through the window. There was nothing, it was powerless to do anything. Them screams will haunt me forever. She needs help up there! She needs help! They were just saying there's nothing we can do at the moment. This is a police officer talking to me at that time. The fire brigade are doing what they can for the people. When I came out 10 minutes, 15 minutes ago, there was only like five floors, and then suddenly she came. Yeah, we got out. As firefighters battle to stop the blaze exploding into the building, Alison Moses spots her daughter. My daughter and her son, they finally came to me. I saw my mum, I held her, because I was scared to lose my mum. But I just could not let her go. When I actually got hold of her, I just held her.
My heart was just beating so fast. By 1.30 a.m., the fire brigade has made two requests for aerial ladder platforms. Before Grenfell, these were not automatically called as first response to tower block fires. 25 fire engines have now been called to Grenfell. Even more are to follow. Hey, is that? That's not a real block for people, in it? I've, I've rushed down to the watch room and it's multiple calls to Grenfell Tower. You knew that something was, something big was going down. A small kitchen blaze is about to become Britain's deadliest fire disaster since the Second World War. That was that. How is that possible? It's around 1.30 a.m. Look, light just went on there, someone just woke up. Look at that. In a little over 30 minutes, a fire on the fourth floor of Grenfell Tower has engulfed the east face, but it's yet to spread around the building. Oh, my God. On the other side, a smoke alarm on the 10th floor wakes up Clarita Gavimi. First, I went to the front door, and I opened it, and uh, it's just a black, pitch black, too much smoke pushing me in, so I shut the door straight away very quickly. I run down to the kitchen and look into the window. There's a lot of people there were shouting. Just above Clarita, on the 11th floor, chauffeur Branislav Lukic is woken up by a friend. Yes. It was around half one. My flat was facing west side, so I didn't see any fire at that time. But huge amount of black smoke got into our apartment. And then I realized something's happening. Branislav has two choices, stay in the flat or run for the emergency staircase. At this stage, the emergency services are still telling residents to stay put and wait for firefighters to come and get them. Aldo Diana heads up a specialist rescue unit. I said to the guys, BA sets on, breathing up breathe sets on with all our personal protective gear see if we can do something straight away. Aldo's team carried twin tank breathing apparatus with, hopefully, enough air to climb 24 storeys up and then back down again. As the fire threatens to start moving round the building, on the 11th floor, Branislav Lukic has decided to make a run for it. In the hallway, it was a pitched black and we got lost in pitched black. A friend of mine said, Luca, we're not going to make it. I was literally holding his hand. I was touching the wall. Clarita Gavimi also needs to make a decision. And I was in the kitchen and I phoned my son. I tried to talk, but there's no word coming out of my mouth. And he was thinking I was, I was in trouble. I was having a heart attack, but then he's hearing the alarm at the same time. Finally, I found the fire doors and fire escape. So we tried to run down. I was thinking my family. I cannot be roasted, I cannot be dying here. I have to get out here. Uh, I got a tea towel, I make it wet, and I, I just went down to the door. Firefighters are already in the building. Now, Aldo Diana prepares to join them. I could see the base of the tower with quite a few firefighters with breathing apparatus waiting to be committed. I, I could see obviously the tower alight. And I'm not sure what, the, what it was that was falling off, but it was just stuff falling off the building. The debris is nuts. Jesus. This burning debris is made up of cladding and insulation fitted to the outside of the building in 2016. The Grenfell Inquiry has since learnt that the cladding was a key reason the fire spread so quickly. Oh my God, it's so wild. Oh shit, oh shit! Days. Whoa, 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 
whoa, whoa, whoa, watch out! As the flames spread, there's a fear that the whole building may now collapse. And the fire poses another threat. We kept on hearing that there's the gas pipes are in the communal areas and it's going to explode and the building's not safe. Go, 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 go! Nobody will know how stable or unstable that building would be. Should you evacuate this area sure, now? Sure, sure, sure. None of us want to lose our lives, but this is the job that we do. That's what we're firefighters. We go in and rescue people. Oh, yo, 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 yo! Oh, shit. Branislav Lukic and Clarita Gavimi have decided not to wait for rescue. Both have left their flats, but Clarita is disorientated in thick smoke. It's just have to grab it in my hand, touching, touching. But I'm shaking, you know, I'm, I'm so scared. I was just mumbling, I was crying. At some point on the way down, we heard some noise. Uh, I opened the door and a um, small Filipino lady was on the other side. And then I saw this two men coming down, they saw me and they just picked me up. Straight away, without talking, you know, just pick me up and grab me. She was frightened, she was frozen, she was crying, choking. I did, I, my eyes was closed all the time. I didn't even see their face. These two men who carried me down. I managed to, to carry her over her shoulder and uh, down the stairs. It's probably only a only couple of minutes, but each minute is like an hour. We finally managed to get down. And I didn't even say thank you to them, and I don't know who they are. On the streets outside, people are searching for relatives and friends. My son was looking for me for two hours, and he was just phoning all the time to his wife, but I couldn't find my mom. And he kept on asking people in the street, the people who know, he knows in the building, have you seen my mom? And they said no, because I was in the other side of the road. It was a relief for him when he saw me. We, oh, we just hugged each other for too long, you know, and crying together. <sighs> As the burning tower lights up West London, more people are filming. Look, there's through water, but never reach only halfway. Look, you see it? Only halfway. An aerial ladder platform, called before 1.30, is being used to attack the flames. Some would later suggest that if it had got there earlier, the blaze might have been put out. On the ground watching is local resident, Hanan Mizu. One of the firemen was going up on that raised platform, and he was only going as far as, like, 11, 12th floor. This guy needs to go higher. I know he's great, but he needs to go He's this guy? And I was like, why is he not going up further? What, what is this? I thought that they had the ladders that would extend 20 floors, but that wasn't the case. It got as far as 12, the 12th floor, and the hose was reaching maybe, what, 14th, 15th floor? And all the families that were above, everybody was like, how are they going to get them out? This guy's sending a roll. I don't do Aye. it, I don't do it. He's made the rope from his blankets and he sent it down. Nearly an hour into the fire, flames are now starting to spread around the building. Now the corner, this side of the building is starting to catch fire. Aye, they need to get these people out quick. But on the sixth floor, Paul Menacer is still in bed. Aye, we need to leave. This is becoming dangerous. I recognise 
someone that was shouting up as a, it was a very familiar familiar voice and it was my friend Samuel Wordy. Help her! Help her up there! I was shouting for everybody to wake up and to get out. He heard my voice. I went to my front door, opened the front door. It was pitch black as smoke. And then he called. That's when Paul called me. I said, how bad is it? He said, there's smoke in the house. Um, I don't know what to do. So I said, you need to get out. Can you get out? The smoke was so thick, which we put, I put my hand out and I couldn't see my hand, the end of my hand. Inside Grenfell's reception area, the fire brigade have set up a command post. The chief fire officer turned up and she reiterated how dangerous this could be and how safe you need to be and not to take any risks. But she gave us the confidence to, just to carry out that task. As I got onto the fifth floor, I made the decision to knock on more people's doors to try and pre-warn people. No one was answering the door. So I got back onto the stairwell because I was starting to cough quite a lot of black smoke. There were fire brigade going up the stairs the other way to me now. The fire brigade told me, get out of the building now. I don't think it really sank in until I actually saw dead bodies on the ground. I'm 100% sure they jumped. 100% sure they jumped off the building. As soon as I got onto Grenfell Road, Paul was down at that bottom of Grenfell Road. We ran towards each other. I ran. <laughs> and when I saw him, I hugged him. Um, he was coughing, constantly coughing. The choice that he made to get out of the flat was the choice that saved his life. Around 2.30, Aldo Diana and his partner move out of the reception area. At the, at the base of the tower, there was a lot of water, and the water was cascading down from inside the building. Once out of the reception area, they move into the building's only staircase. They'd been asked to search for residents on a high floor. The staircase itself was only sort of three foot wide. You've got hose coming all the way down it, you've got water cascading down it. You don't normally have the water cascading down, and it's not until you actually went into the building do you realise why the water was cascading down. It's because the hose had burned through and had become split. And you've got heat, thick smoke, people in shock, people suffering smoke inhalation, some people suffering burns, some people in a state of panic. Aldo soon comes across a man lying motionless on the stairs, but it's hard to know if he's dead or alive. We found one person in the staircase. He was collapsed and uh, so as we came to him, we just thought, well, you can't leave him there. We, we don't know his condition. You can't feel for a pulse, you've got gloves on. So we just decided to pick him up and take him out. Aiming for a high floor, Aldo has to stop again when he finds three more people. Now, the, these people were talking to each other but shouting and obviously inhaled quite a bit of smoke. We decided that we would escort them down to a place of safety. Having come down twice, Aldo once more tries to climb higher into the tower. We came across two women. They were gasping for air. So again, we escorted them down. There's still a sense that something could still go wrong. It was black. You know, you knew there was somebody there, but you could feel them, you, we were close enough. They want to get out because they are, they are suffering. As I'm walking backwards, which was difficult enough because you had hose down the stairs, you had water coming down, they were panicking. Uh, and we have to make sure that they are reassured that we will get them out. And we did get them out. We decided to carry on the task we were doing. Start climbing again. Approaching two hours into the fire, the advice to residents is the same. Stay put until help arrives. This was later severely criticised. You should speak it to someone who's in the building. You to come out, the whole building's on fire.
It's coming up to 3 a.m. The fire at Grenfell Tower has been burning for almost two hours. Inside, temperatures are reaching 1,000 degrees Celsius. Worried about people she knows in the building, student nurse Sapphire Joseph arrives outside. I kept messaging my friend and trying to call her on the phone because I knew she had a big family that lived in Grenfell Tower. She was replying to me. She said she was trying to get hold of her family, but the phone's just going to busy. Very upsetting, very, very upsetting. Aldo Diana is on Grenfell's only staircase. He's been tasked to climb to a floor high in the building. And this is now the fourth time we've gone up these stairs. And this was on the, I think it was the 12th to 13th floor. Uh, we're running low on air. Uh, and even though these cylinders are meant to last 40 plus minutes, they don't when you're working hard. In thick smoke, visibility is almost zero. As we've stepped over some hose, um, I've uh, stepped on somebody that was, that was collapsed on the floor. One of these casualties on the floor coughed. My colleague heard the cough and, I, and he said, kneel down. So we, as we knelt down, we found these two, two people. We both called it. Because one of them coughed, we would pick them up and bring them down. Now I carried one of, the, one of them to the front of me because I couldn't get this person on my shoulder. I remember carrying this person down to it was about the third floor when I came across an, uh, an, another group of firefighters and I handed this person over. Almost out of oxygen, Aldo and his partner are now replaced by a fresh team. So we didn't get to the floor that we needed to get to, but me and my colleague that night um, brought nine people out altogether. At 2.47 a.m., the emergency services abandoned their stay put advice. But for some, it may have been too late. Where I was standing, the police officer was running around and he was shouting to everybody, if you know anybody or if you're on the phone to anybody in that tower, tell them to come out the building now, try and escape. I kept messaging my friend and trying to call her on the phone and then about five minutes later, she just said that they were, they're not able to get out. The smoke's too heavy. The handles on the door were hot. There's elderly people and they wouldn't be able to make it down the stairs. On the 22nd floor, a woman is waving a towel. She's a teaching assistant called Nadia Shuker. Beside Nadia is her husband, Bassam. And with them in the flat are their three children and Nadia's mother, Syria. Around uh, 3.41, she sent a message saying, you know, hi, Nabil. Um, there's a fire in my building, and um, I just wanted to tell you, OK, goodbye. Nabil meets his brother outside. So we wanted to try and get in to the tower to make sure that they had got out, or if they were there, we wanted to help them. <laughs> There were so many uh, everywhere, literally stopping us and not and allowing us to get through. I wasn't even interested if I was going to lose my life or not. I was just wanting to get in. Between 3 and 4 a.m., almost the entire building succumbs to the inferno. Later on that same night, I did witness two other people jumping off the building at different times as well. 
and that was very hard to see as well because I actually witnessed them actually jumping out of their flats and down to their death. They'll stay with us for the rest of our lives. This is a crime against humanity! On the streets, shock turns to anger. That building was not fireproof! The richest borough in Europe! Anger has been brewing in the community since a Grenfell resident group reported their warnings of a tower fire seven months earlier. Many who get out are injured. Now, paramedics must prioritise those most in need. Around 3.30, I saw like a pub. They opened up a trauma centre. So I went and asked, I said, I'm a third year student nurse. Is it possible for me to help? There was one mother with her child who was angry and just really upset, just saying how while she was coming out the building, she lost one of her sons. She was like literally screaming on the floor, where is my son? Where is he? I can't find him. I was holding his hand on the way out of the building. And by the time I got out of the building, he wasn't there. Later on, on the news, I saw that the son that she did lose passed away. By first light, the building's been burning for around three hours. 70 fire engines and over 200 firefighters have failed to stop it. And there are still people inside. In the early hours, the light started to change and the building was still burning and, um, you know, we're very worried, we're very concerned. Nabil is looking for his mother, sister and four other members of his family. They live on the 22nd floor. So I'm thinking, you know, that they have made it out, you know, it's just a matter of finding them somewhere. You know, we, no matter how slim the chances were, we didn't want to give up and we wanted to carry on, just keep carrying on. Grenfell's upper floors have been devastated. But firefighters have managed to keep the flames at bay lower down. Over three hours in, there are still people at the windows. Open the window! Open the windows! Open the window! Open the windows! You can see people inside there, look at that. People are inside. So we're speaking to the fire people here now. Onlookers applaud as firefighters attack flames now threatening a resident's flat. With the flames easing, the fire brigade push higher into the building. At around 4:40 a.m. Aldo Diana is sent up to a floor close to the top. It was very hot at that time, and the whole floor was alight. You know, 100% alight. Your seti, your beds, was just all alight. It was just in, in like piles, just burning. I think people knew at that time that, you know, there wasn't going to be anybody, but you have to make sure, you have to check. So, you know, um, so that's what we did. The, the hardest thing for us is, um, the hardest thing for us when you go up is, uh, when you do see uh, a, a casualty, a body, and you know that there's nothing that you can do now. It's hard to take and what we, what we visualize will stay with us.
We then decided to go up to the floor above to make sure that nobody was missed. All the windows had melted and we went quite close to the edge and uh, it just didn't seem real because inside was devastation. When you looked out, it was just normal life. You know, a normal view. Buildings, trees, uh, the sky. You could see the planes going across. Uh, there was traffic on the motorway. Everything else seemed to be normal. After six hours, Britain is waking up to a fire that is now global news. A major incident is declared as a huge fire engulfs a tower block in West London. Firefighters are tackling the blaze at Grenfell Tower near Notting Hill. Local reports say that residents are trapped in the building. As the nation learns of the tragedy, firefighters have already reached the 20th floor. A structural engineer has arrived to assess the risk of building collapse. As you will appreciate, this is a completely unprecedented fire. In my 29 years in the London Fire Brigade, I have never seen a fire of this nature, and I have seen many high-rise fires. On the streets, the hunt for the missing continues. After searching so many hospitals, we uh, turned around and said to each other, you know, we need to try and get communication, get the posters out and see, doing appeals. Hundreds of people are now homeless. Many have only the clothes they're standing in. Local community and faith centres have been opening since the early hours. Jada Cesar has arrived to help. Uh, all you can see is loads of smoke, it's still not out. It was about half past ten when I started walking towards the fire. I just remember stopping in the middle of the street. You can still see the flames up in the top. So guys, any donations you have... Like many others, Jade is appealing for help using social media. People had come together. You would see these human chains carrying goods and passing it from one person to the other. You would see people queuing up to drop off their donations and people saying, what, what can we do? How can we help? The world's media are now on Grenfell's doorstep. That has recently been reclad, that building, and it used to be concrete moulded fluting. Speculation is rife about the cause of the fire. But there are genuine concerns, reasonable concerns, that have been raised during the course of the night, and it's really important that these questions are answered. Over 220 people have come out alive. 65 of them brought out by firefighters. But many more, including entire families, have been reported missing. Grenfell burns throughout the day as firefighters continue to search the building. You know, we saw firemen red raw. Back their necks, their faces were red raw. I saw them coming out exhausted. In the streets around the tower, the relief effort goes on. Guys, we need your support. We need volunteers. These people need your basic day-to-day -day necessities. They have children. It's now 10 p.m., but the fire refuses to be beaten. Police have confirmed 12 people dead so far, but that figure is expected to rise significantly as the emergency services deal with what they say is a complex recovery operation. At 14 minutes past one on the 15th of June, the London Fire Brigade say the fire is finally under control. 
Grenfell has burned for over 24 hours. I noticed that my sister was in the newspaper waving with her husband right next to her. Very well, I was very 100% certain it was them. 100% and more. And I said to my wife, look, we were both set. The family that I lost was half my life. I can't tell you how much I miss them so much. I can't tell you how much I miss them. This is, doesn't feel the same anymore without them. <laughs> the Grenfell fire claimed 72 lives. Around half of them, including Nadia Shuker and five of her family, were found on the top three floors. This is the closest I've been to it since the fire, like... You just feel so much guilt. You can't sleep, you can't eat because of it. I sit there most nights and I just think about it. You feel guilt because I wish I could have maybe knocked on more doors upstairs instead of downstairs. There are many questions about the 2016 refurbishment, the local authorities' actions and the stay-put policy. The London Fire Brigade defended their advice, saying the fire was unprecedented. Firefighters had to decide whether people should stay in relatively clean air or leave through poisonous smoke. The council did not respond to us about the concerns raised in the programme. Somebody needs to go to jail for allowing that cladding to go on that building. You know, when people do cut corners, they don't anticipate something bad is going to happen. But it did, and it killed lives. In the days after the fire, Clarita Gavimi, carried to safety by a neighbour she didn't know, met her saviour, Branislav Lukic. As far as I remember, I know that a big man who picked me up without thinking, I just opened the door and put me up. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> I give him a big hug and I cry, actually, I really cry. <laughs> I, I, I was so grateful. I'm just so grateful, really, that's all I can say. Once a month, residents hold a silent walk from the offices of Kensington and Chelsea Council to Grenfell. When they get there, firefighters are waiting. I commend the firemen. They saw things we don't want to see. They did their best that they could with what they had. Thank you. Thank you. People hug them. They give them hugs. <laughs> and it's really, really nice. And I, I love the fact that we can embrace them and thank them. I think every firefighter wishes they could have done more. I think every firefighter wishes they could have saved every single life. But it, we, we just weren't going, it's not, we weren't able to. Every day I see the tower and I get this empty feeling inside. Especially at night time, I try not to look at it. Because it looks like a tomb. I 
I want justice. Justice for the bereaved. Justice for our friends that have passed away. And justice for the survivors. Justice, justice, justice. That's it.